for for having me at uh, at the meeting. Uh, I'm I'm sorry that I couldn't make it in in person. My uh, my travel schedule was uh, kind of stuck in, uh, in in a way that I I really couldn't uh, do it differently. But uh, thanks for accommodating for an online presentation. Anyhow, I hope you see my slide uh, and uh, the the pointer, and also you hear me well. Yes, we um, we, we see everything. Good, excellent. Um, so this is on uh, realizing a universal quantum gate set for itinerant microwave uh, frequency photons. Uh, this is essentially part of a PhD thesis, which is ongoing by Kevin Royer. Um, and Kevin Royer works together with uh, Jean-Claude Bess, who works on topics like this in our lab since quite some time. And, uh, and this project is coordinated by, uh, by Christopher Eichler. So what we did in this experiment, we essentially made uh, two nominally identical superconducting uh, circuit devices, which can uh, emit and absorb photons. And sort of this uh, top left device here can create photons and emit them into a transmission line. And these photons can then uh, travel towards a, a second chip where they can be uh, absorbed. You can do single photon gates on on um, on the absorbed photons and re-emit them into the transmission line, and then we were also able to realize uh, um, two photonic qubit gates in this way, uh, essentially sending one photon down from the first to the second chip, absorbing it there, and then having it interact with a second photon that bounces off um, the um, second chip here and. We can then characterize the photons um, using linear detection techniques uh, in the way that uh, Pear had already mentioned by amplifying the radiation fields with uh, microwave frequency amplifiers and then uh, digitizing quadratures and uh, doing tomography um, on the detected radiation fields. So as usual, uh, I'd like to thank in the, in the beginning all the, uh, the different people who've contributed to the progress uh, in our lab uh, throughout the various years. And, and you see what they're doing these days here. Uh, like uh, quite a few of them ended up in faculty positions, which is very nice to see. But what is also interesting is that more and more of them really uh, work in, in the quantum industry, either in, in startups or in companies that provide tools in and around quantum technology. So that, that is, is very nice to see. And I'd also like to thank uh, you know, all the many collaborators that we had throughout the years. Good, so um, you know, why would you care to, um, to realize gates between photons? There's uh, uh, quite a, a few use cases for those. So uh, gates between photons could be used in quantum networks, for example, when realizing quantum repeaters or quantum routers. Um, the ability to perform gates between propagating photons would also allow one to create interesting many-body uh, quantum entangled states. So you could, for example, make cluster states or other uh, 1D, 2D, or 3D graph states in this way, uh, and maybe also use variational uh, approaches, not on uh, um, stationary qubits, but, but on propagating photons, for example. Um, and then there's obviously also the interest in, in doing photon-based uh, uh, quantum computing, that if you had an efficient way to um, realize gates between uh, photons, uh, that could also be implemented then not only with um, um, optical frequency photons, but at, in the microwave frequency domain, um, both with single photons and possibly with, with continuous variables, like uh, uh, in the way that Pear had um, alluded to in the previous presentation. Good, and, and, and this talk here, we're gonna focus on trying to realize a deterministic two photon gate and uh, realizing a deterministic two photon gate is, is uh, an, uh, something that is special uh, across all frequency domains. Uh, so to the best of our knowledge so far, the, even in the optical frequency domain, um, the two photon gates which were realized were post-selected and our work is uh, certainly uh, strongly inspired by the cavity QED work from, from Gerhard Rampes' lab, who pioneered uh, uh, many of the, uh, the ways how you could do uh, gates between propagating optical frequency photons. And uh, uh, so there's two works from Gerhard Rampes' group, which are um, quoted here. And uh, how ours are set apart from those is, is that uh, the experiments that I'll be discussing today uh, require no post-selection. So it's a deterministic two-qubit gate on propagating photons. 
And so here you see um, the sketch of what the um, setup or the experiment looks like. Uh, so there's essentially um, a source qubit, uh, which is on, on one chip, and that source qubit is shown here in red. We can manipulate it in the usual way with microwave uh, frequency pulses and applying flux pulses to change the transition frequency. And then this uh, source qubit is coupled uh, through a tunable coupler and uh, uh, essentially a, a converter qubit that allows us to, at, uh, our, at the time that we desire, launch a, a photon from the source qubit into a transmission line and send it along that transmission line. And this transmission line is intercepted or interrupted by a circulator here, and that allows us to route those photons towards a, a second chip. Um, on which we have a, another um, converter mode realized as a qubit that is coupled with a tunable coupler to, a, uh, to our gate qubit that we'll use to both perform single qubit gates on these photons and also to realize a, a two photon gate between two subsequent photons that were emitted by the source qubit. And then the photons uh, that get re-emitted by the gate qubit are again uh, propagating towards the circulator here and then enter our linear detection circuitry where we amplify the fields with uh, um, um, traveling wave parametric amplifiers or Josephson parametric amplifiers and then uh, digitize the quadratures and do these moment-based analysis, which I will remind you of in a, in a second. Um, so this experiment now puts together a number of previous developments that we have uh, made in our lab. So uh, one of the developments is to create uh, uh, this the capability to create a train of photons uh, from a source that was uh, demonstrated by Jean-Claude Bess as part of his uh, PhD thesis uh, now uh, um, a couple of years ago, uh, which is essentially based on controllably coupling uh, photons or excitations that get created in a qubit into a transmission line. Uh, create subsequent uh, pho photon pulses and create in this way a chain of photons. Um, then we also use another development in um, um, that was part of Jean-Claude Bess's uh, PhD thesis that relates to photon detection. And in this photon detection uh, work, which I'll also explain in a little bit uh, of detail, uh, we've essentially made use uh, of a, a controlled Z gate between a propagating photon and a qubit um, held in a, in a cavity. And this mechanism both creates a, a conditional phase shift on the qubit state, but also a conditional phase shift on the reflected photon. And uh, this conditional phase shift can actually be used to uh, create a two photon gate. Um, and then in the end, we do uh, characterize the states that we have created both for single photons and for two photons in this linear detection scheme. Okay, so, so let me first show to you what our uh, chips look like. So we have essentially two almost identical chips for which contain the source qubit and this converter mode and the gate qubit in the converter mode. And those designs were, were made for previous experiments, and we essentially made a second copy of such a, a chip so that we could use it in this context. Uh, so here's the picture of, of this device, and, and the color code is, uh, is slightly different from what you've seen on the last slide, unfortunately. So we'll need to fix that in, in, in the future. So on this device here, you see um, two superconducting transmon style qubits. Uh, the, the red one here in the left part is, is the storage qubit in which we uh, create the excitations. And this uh, storage qubit we can also read out. So there's a, a readout resonator, which is a lambda quarter resonator here that is coupled through for cell filter um, to a readout line. So that is, uh, can be used, for example, to, to use this chip in a photon detection context as well. And then there is an, uh, a so-called emitter or converter qubit on the right-hand side here shown in blue. And this qubit is strongly coupled to a, um, an input and output transmission line shown in purple here. So once we swap the uh, excitation from the storage qubit into this converter qubit, it will leak at a, a megahertz level rate into this transmission line and create a, a photon in that transmission line. And the storage qubit and the converter qubit are coupled through a tunable coupler. So this has two coupling paths, one static coupling path realized by this uh, um, transmission line here, and then one coupling path that is interrupted by a, a tunable squid that we can then modulate uh, through a flux line. And, and this allows us to essentially 
do a parametric coupling between the storage qubit and the uh, uh, converter qubit, and, and in this way, essentially swap excitations uh, back and forth between the two. So if we want to create a photon, we essentially swap the excitation from the storage qubit into the converter qubit from where it will get emitted into the transmission line. And reversely, when there is a photon arriving from the transmission line, we can essentially switch on um, this conversion pulse or a parametric coupling between the um, uh, converter qubit and the storage qubit and, and absorb a photon uh, into that storage qubit. And uh, yeah, you see that every one of the qubits has a charge line to uh, control its state, and it has a flux line to, con uh, to control its transmission frequency. And this uh, third flux line here is used to, uh, to parametrically drive the coupler between the two qubits. And we have essentially uh, two of these devices, which are, are made nominally identical. Good, so, uh, so that's the two devices that we are using in this particular experiment. Uh, so then let me remind you briefly of this measurement technique that Per already mentioned to you. And, and we're happy to see that uh, even though that it's now kind of uh, 10 years old already as a technique, uh, we still use it in our lab. And, and it also gets used quite actively in this, in this community of uh, researchers that uh, investigate the quantum properties of propagating microwave photons. And that was part of, of Christopher Eichler's uh, PhD thesis. And so the, a good discussion of it is found in this PRA paper from 2012. So essentially, when, when we want to detect uh, the quantum state of a radiation field um, um, through first linearly amplifying it and, and then detecting its quadrature amplitudes, uh, that we essentially, in a first set of experiments, uh, characterize the input noise to this detection chain and uh, um, integrate the x and the p quadratures that we can detect by mixing down the signal uh, on, a, um, on a microwave frequency mixer and then um, store pairwise components of the x and the p quadrature and uh, um, form a histogram out of these data points. And then even if you amplify a gear in the, which was in the initial experiments that we have performed in Christopher's thesis was just a, a hemmed amplifier that added a, a large amount of quasi thermal noise to the, um, to the signal that you're actually interested in, even in sort of a, a parametric amplifier settings, uh, since these, there's a little bit of loss between the sample and the amplifier and the amplifiers are only close to quantum limit, not limited, but not perfectly quantum limited. So this technique is, is kind of useful to remove the residual noise from, from your um, detected radiation fields. So in this early data that is shown here, this uh, histogram that gets formed from this integrated pairs of X and P quadratures uh, has a large width in comparison to the vacuum noise. So you do that essentially without creating any signal and, and that characterizes your detection chain and, uh, and the noise at the input of this detection chain. Um, so then you perform an analysis that is based on calculating the, um, the moments of these statistical distributions of the quadratures. And you do that once with your signal uh, being switched off and that creates this noise moments. And then you switch your uh, signal that you're interested on and in this case, uh, here we've, uh, the example is for Fox state. And uh, then you uh, calculate the moments that are essentially a combination of the um, noise and the signal. And having these two data sets of noise only moments and noise plus signal moments, you can then uh, recover the signal moments. And from those signal moments, as Per had, had discussed, you can essentially calculate any quantity that you're interested in, either the Wigner function or, or the density matrix um, of the radiation field state that you are interested in. And uh, yeah, we had uh, really used that successfully in our experiments in all uh, sorts of different settings. Uh, first to characterize propagating uh, Fox states of microwave photons uh, using this method. You can extend it to, to look at uh, entanglement between qubits and propagating photons. You can look at multi-modal radiation fields, like in this homo Mundell experiment, where you look at um, two detection paths after a beam splitter uh, and use the same method then on two modes. Or you can also look at, uh, at uh, squeezing uh, that as it happens in parametric amplifiers, for example. And so exactly that method gets also used in, in our experiments here um, that uh, we have performed in, um, in our lab. Uh, I see my camera is frozen. Do you actually hear me? 
Yes, you, we hear you. Okay, good. Yeah, so I just wanted to verify that I don't don't speak into the void. Okay, that's good. Um, um, so, all right, so yeah, I have now told you about our devices and, um, and our measurement apparatus. And let me now tell you uh, how we do the, um, the gates, in particular, the two qubit gates, the you know, two photonic qubit gates. And so this, um, this two photon qubit gate was actually inspired by work from Gerhard Rempes lab that I mentioned, uh, which we've also realized in, or which we've made use of, of in creating a single photon detector. And that is essentially um, creating or realizing a controlled phase gate between an incoming propagating photon and a, a, and a stationary qubit um, that may, be, may or may not be uh, um, coupled to a cavity mode. And so I'll explain to you how that works uh, first in this context of the single photon detection experiment that, uh, um, that Jean-Claude Best did as part of his PhD thesis. Um, so besides uh, using linear uh, detection schemes for microwave uh, photon detection. You can also use nonlinear elements, and there were sort of uh, experiments, pioneering experiments with Rydberg atoms, for example, and, and, and also at Yale by Blake Johnson um, initially, and also our lab had contributed to that. And then there's these uh, experiments from uh, McDermott's group and, and Madison. Uh, and then a number of groups have thought about this uh, uh, single photon detection problem and trying to uh, detect radiation fields not. Uh, in the coherent state basis as uh, is done in this linear detection scheme that I had mentioned just before, uh, but try to detect in the, in the FOC basis to essentially get a detector that gets click, does click when, uh, when a single photon gets uh, um, detected. And also there, there was a, a range of, of interesting experiments done uh, also by Benjamin Huar's group, for example, and Yasuna Kamura's group, and, and also by Jean. And, and I'll, I'll explain to you briefly how this, this technique here uh, from Jean-Claude uh, works, because that's the one that we use to perform a controlled phase gate between a, um, uh, essentially two propagating photons. All right, so in, in this concept, which Jean-Claude um, realized, we would like to project uh, uh, our propagating radiation uh, state into a, the photon number basis instead of the quadrature basis, as I'd mentioned. And we're actually making use by a, a protocol what, that was first uh, um, suggested by Duan and, and Kimball. And in that protocol, you actually place a, a two-level or a multi-level system in a, in a cavity, and you reflect the radiation field off of that, uh, that cavity. And you essentially perform a, a gate operation between that incoming radiation field and the, the qubit inside the cavity. And what is special in this case is that um, the qubit inside the cavity has its uh, ground to first excited state transition frequency um, omega GE detuned from the cavity frequency, but the first to second excited state transition frequency omega EF in resonance with the, with the cavity frequency. Um, and then you can create uh, um, either classical or quantum radiation fields and send them as probe fields to your cavity and see uh, um, what the interaction uh, looks like with a, with a, a cavity coupled to a, a qubit. And uh, the radiation field interacting with the cavity in the qubit will then bounces off the cavity. And uh, in this technique that I've mentioned to you already, it gets passed through a circulator and can then be detected using this linear um, uh, detection scheme that I've just mentioned to you. And in this uh, particular experiment, there were two additional features that we were using. So we could independently then read out the qubit state um, in this photon detection context. And we could also inject uh, coherent fields into the detection mode of the cavity, which allowed us to uh, displace this cavity field. And in that context, we could actually uh, perform Wigner tomography on this uh, incoming propagating radiation fields. And uh, in, in this uh, setting, you can essentially measure the parity of the, of the input field. And if you limit the input fields to uh, uh, single photons or vacuum states, that will turn into a single photon detector. Uh, but otherwise, it's a, it's, a, it's a parity detector that you can use also to, uh, uh, to do Wigner tomography and create propagating cat states, for example. Yeah. And as I mentioned, the reflected field, you can then characterize uh, using these quadrature detection schemes. <laughs> 
Okay, so so why is that important? This is important because this is an, a good way how to characterize um, how the um, radiation field that gets reflected off the cavity um, experiences a phase shift that is conditioned on the state of the qubit uh, coupled to the cavity mode. And as I mentioned, so the G to E transition of the qubit is detuned from the cavity while the E to F transition is in resonance with the cavity. So when the qubit is in the ground state and a photon impinges, uh, the photon essentially sees the Lorentzian line of the cavity and uh, it's essentially resonant with this uh, zero to one transition in the cavity, but, the, uh, but since the qubit is detuned, uh, this will not see the vacuum Rabi mode splitting of the cavity. While when the qubit is in the first excited state and the photon comes in, um, this will essentially experience the vacuum Rabi mode splitting between the E to F transition and the incoming photon. So when you look at the spectral response in these two cases, when with the qubit in the ground state, you will essentially see a, a, a a pi phase wrap um, when you go across the resonance frequency of the of the cavity. So that just shows how the phase behaves around the resonance. While when uh, the qubit is in the first excited state, the cavity mode will split into two in this vacuum Rabi mode splitting. And then at the cavity resonance frequency at which you uh, shine photons at the cavity, you will see no phase response. And the reflected field will actually then have the, the phase difference between these two situations with the qubit either being the ground state or in the first excited state imprinted on the reflected field. And this you could of course uh, uh, measure with uh, properly prepared uh, probe fields. And, and we did that in this case with, with weak coherent tones where we've compared um, the phase shift that the weak coherent tone experiences in these two situations. And in that way we could um, just verify that our coherent tone experiences this phase shift of pi when it gets reflected um, on, off the cavity uh, with the qubit installed inside the cavity with this particular frequency configuration that I've mentioned to you. And essentially we use this mechanism uh, now to realize a, um, a gate between two subsequent microwave photons um, um, used in our device. And uh, yeah, this method that I've just uh, presented to you uh, works as a parity detector. And with this uh, parity detector, uh, we have also created cat states and uh, have used the parity detector for doing direct signal tomography. And uh, just as a reminder, these are the two publications that came out of that uh, as part of Jean-Claude Bess's uh, um, PhD thesis. And, uh, so here is the, the parity detection signal. As you see that the parity detector tells you uh, whether you have an even or an odd parity of, of photon EV impinging radiation field. And here these uh, um, different parity states were created by just subsequently uh, um, having an, a number of photons impinge on the, um, on the detector cavity. Um, and uh, you could also herald propagating cat states in this way when you condition um, the detection of the reflected field on whether your parity detector had indicated even or odd parity. Good, so, so let's get back to the, uh, to the actual topic of this, uh, namely the universal gate set implementation for itinerant microwave photons. Um, and so now we put all these elements together, the two chips, uh, with a linear detection and the uh, capability of doing controlled phase gates between a propagating mode and, uh, and a qubit coupled uh, to a cavity. So how does that then work? So um, let's first look at how we create um, um, photons, uh, reabsorb them, uh, create photons, uh, absorb them, and then re-emit them. And as I mentioned, we have source and gate qubits, and those are uh, transmons. They are, as you've seen on the device, they are coupled with this tunable coupler to uh, a qubit that we call a converter mode. And the um, storage mode uh, states we label with G, E, and F, and the converter qubit modes as they absorb the photons from the transmission line, we, we label with zero and one. And uh, okay, in this particular uh, case, we mediate uh, the coupling between this uh, gate or storage qubit and the converter qubit by uh, driving the tunable coupler here uh, at the frequency that corresponds to the detuning between the uh, converter qubit and, and the gate qubit. And when you drive it at that frequency, you essentially uh, mediate couplings between uh, 
um, the E0 state and the G1 state. So essentially that creates a swap between uh, a photon coming in uh, from this transmission line uh, and converting it into a, an excitation stored in the storage qubit. So whenever this is switched on, I can absorb photons from, uh, uh, from the transmission line or when I create an excitation in the storage qubit, I can launch a photon into the transmission line by, by switching on this coupling and then emitting the, the excitation through this strongly coupled converter qubit into the transmission line. And then modulating that coupling strength J of T in time also allows me to shape um, the photon that gets emitted into the transmission line. And that's actually the first thing that, that we've then tried to characterize the system. So here with the source qubit uh, to be able to measure the field amplitude, we've uh, created an equal superposition state between vacuum and a single photon Fox state. And we've uh, then uh, switched on this tunable coupler and shaped the emitted photon. And we've not done anything with our gate qubit. So the photon then just bounces off the gate qubit, uh, propagates once more towards the circulator and then is detected. And so here's the, uh, the mode structure of that detected photon. So that's uh, one of the reference measurements. Um, then in a second experiment, we've created a zero plus one uh, superposition in the, uh, in the gate qubit and have um, emitted that excitation through this tunable coupler in the converter mode into our transmission line that then through the circulator gets detected. And uh, as, we, as you see, the path of that photon is now shorter, so it, it suffers less loss and therefore the, the photon amplitude is a bit higher and the integral uh, under that curve is a bit larger. And from the difference, you can look, uh, um, conclude on the, on the difference in the loss that uh, the photons emitted either from the source qubit or from the gate qubit experiment. So what is then uh, important in the context of doing both single and two qubit gates is, is the capability of creating a photon in the source qubit and then actually absorbing it in the gate qubit and re-emitting it from the gate qubit. So the green curve uh, is exactly that sequence. We emit a photon, absorb it in the gate qubit, keep it there, and then re-emit it um, into our detector and measure it. And you see that uh, in that instance, the, the amplitude of the zero plus one uh, superposition state is even a little bit, bit smaller. And that uh, has to do with both the decoherence that happens during this process and also with the loss in the transmission lines and the loss in the, um, in the circulator that the photons propagate through. Okay, and so then you can check whether, um, whether our controlled phase gate between the two propagating photons work. So what you do first is you, you send the first photon towards the gate qubit. Uh, you either absorb it in the gate qubit or not. Yeah? And, and uh, then dependent on whether you had absorbed the first photon in the gate qubit or not, the second photon will actually interact differently with this gate qubit. Uh, if, if there was no photon absorbed in the gate qubit, the um, second photon will just get reflected with, uh, uh, with a high phase shift. But when you have absorbed uh, the first photon in, in the gate qubit, uh, the second uh, photon will actually not suffer this phi phase shift. And, and this we can distinguish here by looking at the field amplitude and the if there's a pi phase shift between the field amplitudes, we actually see the sign of the field amplitude change. And so this is a direct evidence between this imprinted phase shift that happens conditioned on whether the gate qubit is in, in the ground or excited state, uh, which then is determined by whether the first photon was absorbed or not absorbed. And, and this is the basis for creating the C phase gate between um, two subsequent photons. Um, what we also see is that there is a little bit of distortion in these pulse shapes, and the distortion has to do with the, um, with the fact that the bandwidth of the photons is a bit too large for the coupling strengths of the, um, of the converter qubits to their respective transmission lines. And so if that coupling strength was, a, was larger, I think we would hope that, uh, that the mode shapes would be closer to what we would expect uh, theoretically. Okay, and so then there's uh, um, the two types of gates that one can realize in this way. So there's first single photon gates. Uh, so here's a, um, um, like the gate sequence to realize gates on, on individual photons. So we create a photon one and we apply a unitary to it. So that happens and then the following way, you create photon one in the source qubit, you swap it into the gate qubit, then you apply a gate operation while the photon is absorbed in that qubit, and then you swap it back out into the transmission line. And in this way, you've applied a, a single uh, qubit gate to that propagating photon 
after absorbing and re-emitting it. And then you can do a process tomography on, on, um, on the gates that you realize. And here's an example for an X gate on that photon. And that process tomography, um, you just create all possible input states and do tomography on the output states. And from that, you reconstruct the chi process matrix, matrix for the X gate acting on that photon. And we see that the fidelity, the total fidelity is about uh, 76%. Uh, and that's mostly uh, limited by the loss that the photons experience uh, on the path from the source to the gate qubit. Um, and if we kind of correct for that loss, we can uh, would conclude that the process has an internal fidelity of maybe 87% or so, which is still not perfect. And the main reason for that is that the coherence of the qubits on, on this device is, is, is not uh, uh, so great. I think the, the coherences were on, on the order of 10 microseconds, roughly with the phase coherences at the operating points even being a bit smaller. So then we, we've realized not only X gates, but also identity gates and Y gates, and also the T gate for a single photon and determined the process uh, fidelity um, both as, as measured and then corrected for the loss that it, it experiences. And, and we find roughly 75% single qubit gate fidelity uh, and corrected for loss around, around 87%. And then we looked at how well the photon-photon gate uh, performs uh, by doing quantum process tomography on that as well. Yeah? And, and the photon-photon gate is essentially the C phase gate between two subsequently emitted photons, P1 and P2. And the first photon gets created, converted into the gate qubit, and then stored there. And then the second photon gets created and then interacts in the way that I've explained with the first photon that is now absorbed in the gate qubit. And essentially, uh, you can now do pro uh, quantum process tomography on this on the C phase gate in the in the way I've explained previously, and uh, determine the process fidelity for these C phase gates. And uh, yeah, because of the limited coherence properties, and now the fact that both qubits or both photons suffer uh, from uh, from loss, the fidelity here not correcting for for loss is about fifty seven percent, and correcting for loss is about seventy five percent. And we've tried to compare that uh, to, to what we would expect based on, uh, uh, on master equation simulations, which you see here um, as the um, open bars in, in this uh, plot of the, um, of the chi matrix of the process. Okay, so, um, so we've now done um, single qubit gates and uh, two qubit gates with, I think, uh, respectable fidelity, but certainly for, for having better applications or so, this would need to be improved a fair bit. Good, so uh, for the summary, we've uh, demonstrated the deterministic universal gate set on itinerant microwave photons. Uh, I think the, the uh, fidelities uh, are pretty decent, but could be improved further and probably need to be improved if one wants to use it in, in, in further uh, applications. So one of the ways to reduce uh, a, a, or improve those fidelities by reducing the loss, for example, in a circulator. So one could use uh, um, circulator approaches that make use of superconducting circuits, for example. What would also help is to increase the bandwidth um, of the coupling of the um, qubit, of the converter qubits to their transmission lines that would allow us to do the process faster. And also improving the coherences of the qubits used in this experiment would certainly help. And then if one wanted to, uh, to deal with the loss in other ways. One could, for example, use time bin um, encoded photons and, and use heralding to, uh, um, to reject events in which photons were lost. And that's something that we had presented or demonstrated in a previous experiment. Good, and, uh, um, and if this is then uh, successful, yeah, one could go ahead and uh, use these two photon gates and, and networking applications with uh, superconducting circuits. And maybe just as a, as a reminder or just uh, for, for those who are interested in, so like similar techniques we have used to make uh, multi-photon entangled states of the cluster GHC and W type, and that's discussed in the Nature Communications paper um, um, from fairly recently where, you, where we've made um, states with, with up to four photons and done full tomography on them, but then we've used other methods to characterize the quality of those states with up to 10 photons. Uh, and so I invite you to look at that at that paper here, which is also from Jean-Claude Best. And then I'd also remind you that uh, these uh, techniques are then also applicable for uh, systems where you have qubits uh, separated by larger distances. And, and this is a 
uh, a picture of one of our experiments where we have two cryostats uh, linked over this uh, uh, over a macroscopic distance, and, and now we have at, at ETH a, a nice setup where the two cryostats are separated by 30 meters, and where we can do uh, explorations of non-local quantum physics with uh, superconducting signals. Okay, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, uh, I'd like to thank everyone in our lab for uh, doing great work uh, on this and, and other topics. And I would be happy uh, to take some questions if there's any time left. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andreas, uh, for the interesting talk. Um, do we have questions? Yeah, great results. Congratulations. Um, my question is that, um, can you say like what are the main advantages of your kind of this type of photon source slash receiver than compared to the one you used earlier with this foggy pulse technique? Yeah, I, I think they're they're very closely related, and and in the end, it depends on 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 details. I think. Um, I, I do think that, for example, the, the, the fidelities that we've um, presented with these uh, foggy techniques, the F0, G1, were actually a little bit better because I think the impedance matching and everything was a, a, a bit better on those devices. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm not sure whether this one is particularly better, but it, it just mediates the interaction in a different way. And, and you could essentially uh, pick different ways to to interact the two systems with each other. I think the the main difference here now is that that in this F0 G1 approaches the the second quantum system was essentially an um, a second like a, like there was a qubit and a second cavity from which you then launched photons into a transmission line, uh, and here this is realized with um, with two qubits and instead of using a sideband transition now one uses a a parametric drive between the two systems. And uh, I think then which one does better depends on the details of, of, of the implementation. But I think generally they should be rather equivalent. Um, I think, but our, our new sort of the more complicated devices that we're currently making, they actually make use of these parametric coupling techniques. Uh, um, and and we're, we're looking into looking at, uh, we're looking into creating more complicated graph states from, from photons uh, created in these superconducting systems. More questions? <laughs> uh, just uh, out of curiosity, um, this tunable coupler, like um, when, we, when you don't drive parametrically, is there a special point you want to see that? Like, do you turn off the coupling then or? Yes, yeah, exactly. So, uh, so, the, um, so here in, in this device here, you have these two coupling paths and, and, and this actually allows you to zero the coupling. And, and this is important because you, uh, you want to make sure that, that the storage qubit is, is well protected from the, uh, from the strong coupling into, uh, um, into the transmission line where you create the photons. And, and, and that really then works better when you, when you zero the coupling. Yeah? And in, in this combination where you have a static coupling and a dynamic coupling path, you can, you can just adjust the flux to zero the coupling to potentially store the photon uh, as well as possible in this, uh, in this storage mode. Okay, thank you. So if there are no more questions, so let's thank Andreas again. Yeah. Thank you, and I, I hope you enjoy uh, your conference. Uh, and uh, I'm really sorry that I couldn't make it this time. It was uh, totally on my end that I, I was, uh, I, I just couldn't get my, okay, my travel you. planned out well. All right, thank you very much for having me and uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have further questions on our work in, in quantum optics. Thank you. So is there any announcements?